Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today with State Senator from District 26, Jacob Candelaria, uh, who's an up-and-coming Democrat uh, who I think is just right on the cutting edge. He's smart, he's intelligent, he's a great debater. Uh, he, makes, uh, he makes our arguments look really strong. Um, he's a graduate of St. Pius High. He went to the Woodrow Wilson School of International Policy at Princeton University. He's been uh, the director of Equality New Mexico, was a policy analyst uh, at the New Mexico uh, Law and Poverty Center. Um, one of the things that, uh, that, I, that I remember about him was the night when he debated, I guess you could call it that, uh, Hannah Scandera on on Frontline. This this must have been maybe not on Frontline, on um, uh, New Mexico in Focus, probably about two or three months ago. And what I was impressed with was the utter vacuity of his opponent and the enormous amount of energy and information and well constructed arguments that he uh, that he laid upon uh, the debate. So I'm really honored to have you with us, and it's a delight, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Well, it's thanks for the invitation. It's an honor to be here uh, with you. I've watched these programs, and it's 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 pretty exciting to be sitting in this seat here, and after that kind of introduction, you know, and uh, looking forward to a good good chat today with you and with your viewers. So let's get right into education in New Mexico, and uh, your your views of the Martinez administration's handling of of what has now sort of glibly become uh, educational r reform. I'm not sure it actually is reform. What are your views about what's happening and what ought to be happening in New Mexico? So first I'll sort of give a summary of what I think for, you know, from my chair in the Senate and just being a member of this community, uh, what I see has been happening in education policy and, and where this administration has tried to take us. You know, it, it's one thing to have a soundbite. And it's one thing to have an idea that sounds good, that plays well in a poll. And it's a very other different thing uh, to f push for reforms and to push for ideas that actually benefit students, uh, that benefit parents, and that benefit communities. Because when we think about education, we're not talking about this sort of isolated uh, issue. We're talking about something that impacts family. Uh, it can be a tremendous avenue towards social and economic advancement, to the development of that child, and to the growth and development of our communities in this state. Uh, my major uh, opposition and objections and concerns, perhaps, to this administration's policies is that they largely seek to take teachers and parents out of the driver's seat uh, when it comes to the trajectory and to the decisions of a child's education. Um, third grade reading retention in New Mexico, when boiled down from all the arguments that are given, is nothing more than allowing bureaucrats in Santa Fe the ability uh, to say that your child will be held back because we think it's in their best interests. It takes that decision away from the teacher and it takes that decision away from the parent. And when we start taking parents and communities and teachers out of education and start putting it in the hands of people who have political or economic incentives, that's where I think we start treading down dangerous ground. Uh, I think we need to go in a different direction in this state. Uh, we have enormous challenges, poverty, uh, long-standing issues uh, that, that manifest in really tragic ways. And I think we see it on a daily basis in our community and it boils up in these sort of tragic cases. Uh, we need to have a stronger commitment to the child and to their growth and development. And I think that begins with early childhood. I think that, it, begins and, and starts in a way uh, with strong investments in children uh, and with tailoring an education experience that meets the interest and needs of the individual child and not some broader uh, political interest on the part of some bureaucrat at the public education department. So on the one hand, we see uh, children being um, almost sort of replaced by uh, profit-making out-of-state corporations by out-of-state hired bureaucrats who really n n know very little about New Mexico. Uh, the individual child, who really only a teacher 
and a parent can understand the the intricacies of the inner life of children, so, you know, as we all know, is fascinating and, and wonderful. But if you ignore them, if you treat them like widgets, then the whole joy and glory of learning is destroyed uh, because they know they're being discounted as people and they're being treated as numbers and statistics. What, uh, what kind of actual uh, classroom experiences do you think we need to give our children now? What kind of emphasis, what kind of help do we need to give our teachers in order to get back on track uh, from being demoralized and attacked and, and abused? I think first it's important to realize that I myself, and I don't think anybody who's raised objections to the direction uh, Secretary-designee Scandera wants to take our state, objects to this notion of accountability. Yeah. Um, we care about kids. Uh, my number one concern when it comes to education is the children. Uh, I don't have children yet, I hope to someday, and, and to educate them and raise them in this state. Uh, the experience of, experiences we need to be providing, essentially, I think, need to be valuable and uh, need to be reasonable and need to be tailored uh, to the reality we live in. Um, I think it's very important that children nowadays uh, have critical skill development in how to solve problems and how to process information. Uh, cognitive skills. They need to know how to use technology. They need to know how to solve complex issues because inevitably those are the skills that are going to serve them well in the long run. Uh, the education we provide kids today uh, needs to be and look very different than what we provided 30, 40 years ago. Uh, in part, that's why I introduced a bill uh, that would require or permit uh, children to have exposure to coding languages, to learn how to code computers. Uh, these are the kind of new and exciting directions I think we need to be taking our kids, recognizing they're going to be entering a world that looks a lot different uh, than the one that existed 20, 30 years ago, and, and it's a disservice on our end uh, to fail to recognize those challenges uh, as policymakers and as, and as folks that are making these decisions right now. So I'm really interested in in your um, in why you decided to get into politics. I mean, here you here you graduated uh, from obviously a very good education at St. Pius, and you go to you, you go to Princeton. You come back here, uh, which is I'm really glad you did come back here. But what is the what do you hope to achieve as a as a political being in New Mexico? Oddly enough, the person that summed up my my thoughts about politics and public service the best was probably Margaret Thatcher, uh, <laughs> and and I know it's it make you know strange bedfellows right, but Margaret Thatcher had this saying and it came out in the movie uh, version of of her life of her life story and of her and of her biographies, and she always thought politics was about doing something and not being somebody. You know, I know I'm somebody because I have a family that loves me. I have interests and and I have my own sense of who I am. Uh, for me, politics is about the art of doing something. It's about the art of solving problems that individually I can't really make much of a dent in. And, and that's what drives me and what I'm interested in and, and why I've chosen to dedicate uh, this part of my life and hopefully continue dedicating my life to public service. And and so I think when you say, you know, political being or, or a political uh, life, there's a distinction for me. Um, politics is one thing. And for me, politics has always been a means to an end. And that end is, is public service. It's being in a position to make decisions that hopefully improve the world we live in today and, and make things a little better uh, for folks. Now, that passion for me, I think uh, it's in my DNA. Um, I was raised uh, by my grandmother uh, and my mom, who for most of my life was a single mother. And it's really frustrating for me uh, to be lectured at in the legislature about what it's like to live in poverty and these judgments people have about folks that are just trying to get by and, and work and, and provide for their families. And the really negative things that I think politicians like to say about those people. Those people. Yeah. Well, I was those people. I lived that experience. And because of my parents' hard work and my grandmother's sacrifice, I attended the Ivy League. And have had experiences and opportunities that 
most, if not all, the other kids in my neighborhood were unable to have. And throughout that time, uh, it was really clear to me that my parents and grandparents never allowed their struggles, their individual challenges, economically or likewise, to stop them from being decent people yeah. and from helping other people in their community. Um, and that, that meant sometimes giving food to other people who couldn't afford it, uh, providing money to pay bills for other people, though we didn't have all that much. That was a powerful example for me. And, and that's what I use as sort of my true north uh, in, in, in my service in the Senate, is the day where I stop remembering those lessons is the day I intend to get out of elected office. Because at the end of the day, uh, we as a community, um, we shouldn't revere our elected officials, we should respect them, but we should expect things from them. Because at the end of the day, we sign up for it <laughs> and we owe a duty. And, and it's that sense of duty um, that I think motivates me more than anything else. You know, we, 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 all, we all know that, uh, that, that those people who, um, who work terribly hard and who work for institutionally uh, lower wages are oftentimes much more generous than, than the people who are terribly wealthy. Uh, because they understand um, what it means. Um, as a as as a, a political being myself, although I've never held office, um, I noticed that that we've had a very curious and sort of amazing thing occur in New Mexico: a poll uh, run by uh, basically Republicans has uh, suddenly appeared but not appeared in the journal, of course, suddenly appeared which puts uh, a Democratic gubernatorial candidate, Gary King, in tied with uh, the current, with the incumbent. Um, I see two very different people running for that office. A person who is deeply rooted in New Mexico versus a person who is deeply rooted outside of New Mexico. Anyway. I don't need to get into that, but I'm really curious from your position in the Senate, what do you think that poll is actually telling us, depending on its accuracy, of course? But I think the, the poll is tapping into uh, the hard reality that many New Mexicans are living. And maybe these aren't the stories that are told in the journal. Uh, maybe these aren't the stories that are shared. Uh, as, as sort of sound bites by those people in power. Um, but it's a real sense that our state is going in the wrong direction and, and has been going in that direction, in that wrong direction for several years now. You know, I, I spend one weekend a month uh, still going door to door in my district. I run every four years, but I spend one weekend a month going into my community and just going to the door, introducing myself as, as senator for the area and, and talking to people. And there's still a great deal of fear about the state of the economy. Uh, there's a great sense of discontent about the state of our education system. And what concerns me more than anything else is there is this now growing sense of how can things even get better? I mean, we, we're, we're losing a critical sense, I think, in our political discourse and in our city and in our state about what is possible. And, and we've lost the capacity in this state to dream. And those are two things that may sound a little idealistic or may sound a little up in the clouds, but why else get up in the morning yeah. if, if you don't know where you want to go and if you have no aspirations for yourself? I think that poll is tapping into that sense that the current state of our leadership in Santa Fe and in Albuquerque uh, is not showing us that direction. They're not, they're not pointing us uh, to, to any place where we can see a change, a positive change for the people of this city and this state. You know, Albuquerque is the only city in a double dip recession in this country. And I'm going to say that again. We are the only city in a double dip recession in this country. New Mexico is one of only two states to still be losing jobs in the United States. These are problems that we cannot blame on Washington because apparently 
48 other states <laughs> and 99 other cities have figured out how to work around Washington <laughs> and, and chart a new and better course for themselves. So I think people are looking for answers. They're looking for a new direction and they're looking for a candidate and for, 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 for ideas on what is possible in New Mexico. What is that dream we hold for ourselves as a people? And, and going back to my earlier statement, that's what politics should be about. It should be about a conversation between all of us as New Mexicans, as Americans, as Albuquerqueans, about where do we want to be together? And that conversation isn't happening. And I think that the poll that you're referencing demonstrates a real hunger on the part of, of our people uh, for that conversation to start taking place. It's obviously incredibly hard to have dreams, although we all do, if we're literally struggling 80 hours a week at minimum wage jobs, uh, which nobody recognizes as hard work, nobody gives us much credit for, uh, struggling and struggling and raising families and trying to raise families uh, in, a, in an environment that is purposefully suppressed and repressed in terms of wages. Uh, we now notice that uh, uh, Sydney Squires, Secretary of Health, I'm sorry, of uh, Human Resources, um, has uh, made a proposal to require people on food stamps to do even more work than most of them are doing in order to get them. I'm not at all, I'm not at all against the notion of community service, but most people on food stamps are not just lying back as someone has said, eating bonbons, uh, um, uh, they're they're working their tails off all the time. So I'm curious about um, your view of, of um, minimum wage and how it plays into your idea of building local careers that get people someplace in the new world ahead of us. You know, there's a, there's a lot of important issues uh, in that question. And the first one I'll, I'll touch on is, is uh, the state of our human services department in New Mexico. Um, you know, the, the current secretary, Ms. Squire, has essentially, and I believe Congresswoman Lujan Grisham pointed this out in Washington, has basically said that she will not appear, testify, or answer questions by the New Mexico legislature. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just going to ask <laughs> to your viewers, if you just stop showing up for work, uh, how much longer would you have a job? Um, I, I find it very difficult uh, to understand how uh, you can say you want to develop good policies for the state of New Mexico, that you want to do what's right for the state of New Mexico, and yet you refuse to work collaboratively with the people's elected representatives, the 112 people that the state of New Mexico and its people have said, we want to entrust with this decision. Uh, so that's an issue for me, and it continues to be an issue. Um, the, the issue of the work requirements that we're seeing discussed in the context of food stamps, I think there's, there's two major issues at here. One, again, we talk about ideas that that sound good during elections and, and politicians can come up with these in some kind of back room. And, and we all do, people always do that. But then there's those ideas that actually will help people and, and will, will change things for the better. No one, and I'll say this with confidence, I don't think anybody just wants a system or wants to give handouts to anybody. I think the goal we all have, or we should have, is to develop a social network, a social safety net system of which food stamps are a part uh, that help people lift themselves up, that provide people the tools and resources they need to advance themselves and their families. Yeah. And, and what I'm concerned about is this policy that's being proposed by the Human Services Department, along with a few others that they've been talking about, uh, don't help people advance. They put up barriers and, and they cut the proverbial bootstrap. I mean, I don't know how you expect people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps when you cut it off. Yeah. Um, that's, that's my major area of concern here. Uh, 
of course, the issues of poverty in New Mexico are complex, and it's a real challenge we need to face maturely as a state and understand there's no quick fix. Um, the minimum wage, I think, is an important step in the right direction. Uh, I voted for uh, the bill and the constitutional amendment in the last two sessions to increase the minimum wage slightly in New Mexico, because as a former student of economics, um, it's very clear that in the last 50, 60 years in this country, corporate profits, when you look at the top 50 companies in the U.S., have increased astronomically. It has been a period of sustained, tremendous growth uh, on aggregate uh, for the rich. Uh, at the same time, wages continue to go down and down and down. And the taxpayer, inevitably, picks up the bill. Yes. Because when a minimum wage worker can't afford housing, health care, or food, the taxpayer helps to fit that bill. So for me, the minimum wage, a part of that debate is, do we want workers to be paid fairly? Or do we, as a community, want to continue providing tax relief for people like Walmart or corporations like, well, I shouldn't call them people, corporations <laughs> like Walmart, though the Supreme Court and I may disagree on that one. Do we continue to provide <clears throat> corporate welfare and corporate tax cuts for companies like like Walmart and subsidize, use taxpayer dollars to subsidize their ability to pay poverty wages. Yeah. For me, that's the simple question uh, from an economic standpoint when we have a conversation about the minimum wage. And lastly, you know, you, you touched upon something that I think is very important. I value hard work. I value people's work. Uh, my family worked hard. Growing up in San Jose, uh, my mom worked two jobs to put me through school. Uh, that was with the support of my grandmother and, and of our whole family. Uh, she and my stepfather have since built a business uh, that employs over a dozen people in Albuquerque uh, through their hard work. So I respect hard work, and I think that our tax policy, the way we treat and value work should be reflected in the decisions we make in Santa Fe. Uh, that's precisely why uh, I voted against uh, the bill in 2012, in 2013 rather, my first year in the session in the legislature that would re greatly reduce the corporate income tax rate in New Mexico. And that corporate income tax rate cut benefits companies again Walmart and the like, does not benefit your mom and shop pops in New Mexico, who are actually the, the businesses that employ people, uh, gave them a tax cut, and to pay for it, increased the gross receipts tax. Yes. Charming. Increased the tax that we all pay on everything that we buy, except for food and medicine, generally. How can you say that you value people's work, that you value hard work, that you want to incentivize hard work, when you make hardworking people pay more so that big corporations pay less. I think when you'd be a little more consistent in Santa Fe, and you know, I was one of only eight senators to vote no on that bill. Uh, do the math, that means there were a lot of, a lot of folks who voted for it. Um, and I just thought it was, a, it was a defining moment in my first session about where do my values actually lie? Um, do they lie with, with the people that I ran to represent? Or do they lie uh, with sort of the wheeling and dealing culture that can easily take over uh, in Santa Fe? So there's a, uh, there's, there's a thing that hardly anybody really likes to talk about. Um, it's, the, it's the hierarchy of fixed wages in a country. If, you, if you're a writer and a journalist, and like Benito and I, uh, running the Mercury, we're used to a to a to a st stratigraphy of wage that is never very big. Same thing for waitresses. The same thing for uh, uh, all kinds of hardworking people. Uh, and then there are jobs which you can literally not do the work, not attend the legislature, not listen to the legislature, and still get paid. Paid enormous salaries, like uh, like the Secretary of Human Services. Um, that's just an 
automatic disparity, which I think uh, the minimum wage is a mild uh, uh, fixative, possibly, uh, but it needs to be much, much higher than it is. In any case, you talk a lot about local careers, and it's an idea that I think is so important because it because if it's the right kind of, of careers, it bursts that stratigraphy of wages, which most people simply can never get out of. Um, so would you, would you kind of mm -hmm. talk a little bit about local careers? That's mm -hmm. a great idea. Yeah, I think the, the issue of, of local careers, which when I say that, I mean empowering our own people in New Mexico to not only find jobs, but to make their own jobs to open their own small businesses, to become entrepreneurs, to build a shop, to build a legacy that they can pass on to their children and create that basis of wealth that can be transferred from generation to generation. Um, for me, it comes down again to a question of leadership and vision. Uh, where do you want to take this state? So let's ask ourselves, what New Mexico do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a New Mexico where we provide almost $1 billion in subsidies to large corporations, most of them out-of-state corporations, to come in here and offer minimum wage or near poverty wage jobs. That's one vision. And there's a lot of people who want to take us down that road. Uh, there's another vision, I think, uh, for this state and for this city uh, that involves investing in our own human capital. You know, a good friend of mine just ran for governor, Alan Weber. And he talked about, in his race, something I thought uh, sounded good, and, and I think it made some sense, which is that the future of New Mexico, and I would say the future of Albuquerque, is hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. We have enormous potential and creativity and intelligence and drive and hard work and integrity here in our city and here in our state. But we have not, as a state and a city, made the decisions to invest in that capacity. So in the legislature, to do my own part, uh, I've really tried to champion uh, the growth of our homegrown tech industry in New Mexico. Uh, one company that I'll mention, Lavu, which is a point of sale software system, and the owner lives in my district, and I've spent a lot of time talking with him, um, employs now 50 New Mexicans, but will soon uh, employ 100 New Mexicans. Uh, in that industry, uh, the average wage is $90,000 a year. It is an industry that doesn't use much water uh, and does not have much of an environmental impact. Uh, but yet we as a state have not responded adequately to the needs of those entrepreneurs to create the environments necessary for them to grow. So I think that's the fundamental shift in thinking and the shift in leadership that we need to see. That instead of spending again, almost $1 billion a year of, of the taxpayers' money to try and lure big out-of-state corporations to New Mexico, we need to start investing more in our own people, in our own shops, in our own small businesses. Now, that's not to say that we don't try and, and go after economic opportunities that make sense for New Mexico. You know, I've, I've, I've suggested along with Senator Keller that we be more aggressive as a state in trying to lure Tesla here um, because I think that deal would make sense uh, for this state. But there is a big difference between where I think we need to go uh, and where we're at. And, and there's a big difference between the current approach to economic development uh, that, that's been in place for the last several years and where I think we need to go. Um, as a city uh, here in Albuquerque, um, when you drive around and, and you see the number of businesses that are empty and, and you see the number of foreclosures and you see that laid over the amount of crime that's happening in our city, it raises questions for me. And it asks me, if the ship is going down, think of it this way. If you were next to the, to, to, the, to the captain on the Titanic and you saw the iceberg, wouldn't you change captains before you hit it? Yeah. And that's where I think needs to happen. Bill O'Neill is going to uh, sponsor, Senator Bill O'Neill is going to sponsor a hate, hate crime enhancement uh, bill in the next, in the next session. Um, there's been 
um, uh, a lot of speculation about uh, the murders of two homeless men, I believe in your district, mm -hmm. um, uh, near Central, uh, as it being a hate crime. Um, I'm wondering, I know this must have been incredibly traumatic for your district, and it certainly was for the entire city. We tried to cover it in some way that was that um, asked uh, asked the state uh, to treat these young men as these boys as human beings, not as beasts, and, and uh, try to understand what actually happened to them and what the pressures were on their lives. But this this seems to be clearly one of the terrible uh, consequences of of our awful poverty. Uh, not that not that poor people are more prone to violence than other people. But if you happen to be prone to violence, uh, there are certain kinds of pressures that I think manage to trigger it all. And so I'm, you know, this is a long-winded way of asking you, uh, what did happen in your district when those two men were killed? And what was the general sort of um, response in terms of the poor, in terms of, uh, of what, to what needs to be done in our state to to help people. You know, I, there was a tremendous sense of sadness um, in, in our community. Uh, I represent West Central. The West Central Corridor is, is a major artery of my district. And there's a lot of amazing neighborhoods there and, and strong, committed communities uh, who want to see that area be revitalized and take a great deal of pride in where we live. And I share in that pride and that commitment. Um, it was tragic and heartbreaking. Um, to have that happen in our backyard and, 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 and to have that happen to these two men um, who were on a very vulnerable edge of society. Um, in the short term, uh, I think that Senator O'Neill's bill is a good proposal. Um, at the end of the day, these two men, three men, there's actually three men, one who, thank God, got away. These men were targeted because they were different. They were targeted because of that difference. And that difference being homelessness. So I think in the short run, uh, I, I intend to vote for, and I have voted uh, for in the past when the bill was first introduced, uh, an increase uh, to our state's Hate Crimes Act to include homelessness. Uh, it's sad and it's tragic that we have to be having that conversation. Um, I hope that this tragedy uh, and this act of violence allows us as a state to again recognize the common commitment that we have to one another. Uh, I think when you have a city the size of Albuquerque, about 500,000, 600,000 people, depending on what communities you include in the metro area, and you only have, and, and speaking with some of my friends in the, the homeless advocacy and service community, we only have about 400 housing units in this city that are available and dedicated to housing the homeless. 400 for a city the size that we are. Yeah. That's unacceptable. Yeah. At the end of the day, the best thing we can do as a city and a state is make investments in affordable housing so that families, hardworking families, don't fall into homelessness and so that we provide people the stability and the home base they need to work through all the other issues that surround this problem substance abuse, behavioral health, and the like. That's where I think we need to go. Or we can continue turning a blind eye to the problem, yeah. which is, I think, what we've done yeah. as a city and as a state for far too long. So I hope that this emboldens us in Santa Fe and in Albuquerque to make some pretty dramatic and, and changing steps. Uh, Utah, for instance, has done exactly this. And, you know, Utah is not this, you know, this, this, uh, this, this paradise of liberal thought by any means. Yeah. But they, they, they answered the problem of homelessness with, well, let's, let's help find these people homes. And big surprise, when they did that in Salt Lake, violent crimes went down. They began to make dents in the issue of substance abuse and alcoholism. Wow. And they provided stability to communities. So either we can choose to really solve this problem or we can try 
and continue turning a blind eye. And I, and I hope that we do what's right um, in this city, in this state. Um, at the end of the day, though, you know, I'm not one who thinks that government can solve every problem or that there's a prescription or some magic wand that we can wave in government to solve something. Um, I think this is an issue that, that should make all of us look at ourselves in a way. And, and I mentioned at the memorial service, our, our city councilwoman, Clarissa Pena, had a, a beautiful memorial service for these men uh, this past Saturday. And I, and I was there along with many of the other legislators from the area. Um, I think it's important for us to think about, had these men not been killed, how many of us would have turned away from them, and shunned them, uh, refused to give them a dollar, refuse to volunteer for any kind of homeless shelter. Um, those are the hard questions we should ask ourselves as a community uh, and, and ones that I hope will lead all of us just to be a little bit more compassionate uh, in our daily lives. Because I don't think it should take someone being victimized in this horrific, violent way to remind us that we do share uh, some level of compassion and commitment to the community that we live in and to the people that inhabit that community. And, you know, I'm a proud Catholic. Uh, I, I'm a person of faith. Um, I go to mass every Sunday. Well, that's not the moniker of the best Catholic, but I do go to church. And, and to me, my faith teaches me that what you did to the least of my brothers, that you did unto me. And I hope that's the lesson at the end of the day regardless of what we do in Santa Fe or what's done here in the city of Albuquerque, that we all start taking that lesson a little bit more to heart. It seems clear to me as well that, uh, that indeed homeless family needs uh, need homes, but the families also need jobs. And um, uh, I'm not one to um, either to think that g government can wave a magic wand or anything like that, but uh, Government in New Mexico and the United States has always been a major mm -hmm. supplier of work. Mm -hmm. Honest, hard work for the public's good. You can't run a business, you can't run a private business without a police department, without our roads, without sewers, without water, all the things that we need that are done by public employees and public institutions. And uh, we see uh, this, uh, this, this, this incredible uh, vilification of public work. So, um, how does one, how does one get around that? How does one re, re, reinvent the public employment uh, that we need in this state? I mean, we're, you know, our dams are, are falling apart. Uh, we don't just need federal money to do that. We can do, you know, lots of other small things. Uh, our roads need a lot of work. There's lots of jobs, lots of work for lots of jobs. Many of those uh, jobs could be handled by homeless people. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Um. I think there's, there's two things we need to remember and maybe remind ourselves of uh, in, in regards to that issue. The first is when we're, when we're talking about public employment or public projects, it's probably a truism to say, but I think we may you know, need some reminding that the operative word there is public. Yeah. Uh, this isn't money uh, that we're spending and throwing into the ether uh, and wasting. This is money that is designed uh, to improve our quality of life, uh, to make our lives more enjoyable, to provide critical infrastructure and critical services to people. Um, I think we saw the most dramatic and tragic example of what happens in a community when you vilify public workers, when you vilify public functions, when you vilify investments in our community, uh, in the Omari Varela yes. tragedy that happened last year right before session. Uh, this administration has greatly understaffed that department that was in charge of protecting that child. So I think the critical part of all of this is I support public employees, I support public projects, I support public education, not because I want to give one individual a job, right. not because uh, I want to serve one specific group of people or I have a relationship with the X, Y, or Z, but because the public functions that these entities perform are critical 
for us to live in a safe, healthy, vibrant society. There are things that the private industry should do and that the private industry does very well. But when it comes to protecting vulnerable children, when it comes to building roads that we all need, when it comes to providing safety, fire and police protection, those are things government needs to do and should do well. And I'll tell you, those feelings are what drive me to be just as angry and furious when I hear about waste and fraud and oh, abuse and people who betray that trust. And, you know, I voted for bills in the legislature that have gotten me in trouble uh, with some of my own party that have called for more accountability, that, that have called for harsher penalties for people who betray that public trust because it means so much to me. That's part of the change, that we need to remind ourselves that these investments we make are investments we make in each other, not in one particular group of people. The second part of it, VB, I think, is we hear a lot um, from my good friends on the other side of the aisle, uh, and I will say I have you know great relationships in the legislature with many Republicans, and I've, I've co-sponsored bipartisan bills, and and in many on the variety and the majority of issues, you know, the D in front of my name disappears when I'm up there because you got to try and find a way to make the best things happen that you can uh, with the limited time that you have as a legislator, especially when we're in session. The other part of this, though, that needs to be looked at that we need to change as, as a society is the perspective that, well, Public employees have a pretty decent retirement. I don't have that good of a retirement, so I should hate public employees. <laughs> I should vote against their interests. I should attack them. And to me, that's nothing more than the politics of division to mask a greater problem, which is why in this country and in this state and in this city do we not provide that kind of retirement security for all people? That's the question we need to start asking and not just blaming the public sector for the benefits they have because of their hard work, mind you, not just given to them because someone felt like it, but the benefits they've earned. Let's stop blaming them for having what we don't have in the non-government sector, but start asking, well, why don't we have it? Why don't we have greater job security? Why don't we have a better retirement infrastructure? We are in this country at a period of time where a retirement crisis is bubbling up Boy, it is. in a way that we have not seen since the Great Depression. The percentage of Americans now that will retire in the next 10 to 20 years who have less than $30,000 saved for their retirement is very troubling. Yeah. So instead of blaming public employees for that problem, we should start looking at what is it in our financial system? What is it in our tax structure? What is it in the way that we reward or punish savings by middle-class Americans? What is it about those systems that deny people those opportunities and stop just trying to blame somebody else? I don't like blaming politics. You know, I don't like this politics of division. It's what troubles me about the governor's crusade to take driver's licenses away from unlawful immigrants. And I'll share with you one of the most poignant uh, and troubling moments that I've had as a legislator. Uh, the bill to repeal the driver's licenses uh, was in my committee, in the Senate Public Affairs Committee, uh, which Senator O'Neill is a member as well. And, the arguments on this have been fettered out on both sides. And, and it's clear to me now, this is no longer uh, an issue um, that at least some people are willing to engage in an intelligent conversation about or an issue where people want to find compromise. I think there are compromises that can happen and that can make this law work better for people, for everyone. What frightens me is the day before I went into that hearing, I said, well, I'm going to do this. I went onto the governor's Facebook page 
And these aren't things the governor said herself, or I'm sure, I'm not saying any of her staff said it. But the comments that people left about undocumented immigrants in relation to this issue, that they were not human, that they should be sent back, that their children carried disease, that they didn't deserve any level of protection as people. And that scares me when politics is used as a tool to drive people apart and to make us afraid of one another. That may win an election, but it does long and serious damage, I think, to us as a community. And it makes it impossible for us to move forward. And I really pray that that politics of division loses some of its popularity in Santa Fe because it is doing real and permanent damage to the state of New Mexico. The politics of division. I, um, I know that I've been accused and, and a lot of people like me have been accused of being divisive. <clears throat> I like to say that I'm only responding to, uh, <laughs> to, to divisiveness. But I think you're right. There is a, there has to be a sense of, of hope of commonality, of common humanity that, uh, that drives our better natures. Um, and uh, I think you've given us a view of, of many important things today. And I, I'm, I'm really excited to have had a chance to talk with you. And I hope we get to do it a lot more. Uh, and I'd like to sort of, maybe the next time we could talk a little bit about the West Side in Albuquerque and about other things. But it's been a real pleasure to have you here. And I'm, I'm just delighted. Thank you. Thank you.